Uh, I think the reason for this meeting is to really get the public input and to make those changes before we submit it to the community board. And uh, I think your point that there have been good suggestions made are, are well taken. And uh, when it comes from a body like this, it adds greater momentum to making those changes than existed before. The second one is on the issue of the license, the environmental impact statement on the, uh, on the waste management site. It's critically important that that fight be won because it's not only important for that site, but for any future sites, they do a full environmental impact statement. The fact that they're not required to do that, I think is absolutely wrong. This gentleman. One of the biggest problems I see with this waste transfer, and everybody is right about the trucks that roll onto our streets every way possible. It's not Manhattan Avenue. I've seen trucks in every block, all over Greenpoint, going across the uh, expressway. You can't imagine how many trucks I see. And these are older houses. Their foundations are not that well. You know what I mean? And with these trucks rumbling and rumbling, I don't care what they do, things are gonna happen in this area. And this is what we should start curtailing this waste business. That's all, please. <laughs> I am uh, not a resident of Greenpoint, but I do have my business located in Greenpoint. And I would like to find out more about this youth program and to see if something like that could be expanded, perhaps with the help of businesses in the neighborhood, without necessarily having to do this through, you know, uh, part of the 197 plan. I think that's something that probably could be done. What are you talking about? Tree planting. Oh, okay. Yeah. The city and the state. Take the mic, John. How are you all? There are um, there have been three tree season plantings done already in the community. Um, I would say less than half of the funding of the 2.7 million dollars that is to be spent in this community has been spent in the community. Um, the way people get trees, whether they own factories, houses, um, are to fill out tree form applications. Um, there have been hundreds coming in. Um, there, we are still looking for hundreds more. So if you want a tree, um, our organization is called Neighborhood Roots. Uh, we'll get you a tree application. I'll give you our phone number or I'll take your address down. We'll get it to you, get it to us within a season or two. If the Parks Department deems your sites to be viable for tree planting, the only reason you wouldn't get a tree is that there are gas lines that are preventing it or there's a lamppost, but in most cases, I'd say 99% of the cases, you'll get at least one tree planted in front of the building. Um, for very wide buildings, there have been factories that have gotten um, four or five trees. Look across the street at the um, new fitness center. All those trees lined up Collier Street came from this Asian Beetle Fund, which has plenty of money left in it. So I uh, really suggest everyone to take advantage of it. And uh, grab me b before you leave tonight. Um, we'll write, you know, we don't have any forms with us tonight, unfortunately, but. Small manufacturers, small manufacturers as good neighbors. Is there, uh, did the committee do any kind of research on what kinds of manufacturing we have in a lot of the areas? that you're now designated as mixed residential uh, and commercial or manufacturing use? Because it seems to me that not all, I mean, there are a lot of businesses in those areas currently that do not seem to me to be operating on what one might want to call best practices or the high road <laughs> and are operating pretty much on the low road. Uh, the cheapest kind of labor with the cheapest kind of materials and doing things pretty much in terms of trash and things very haphazardly. I mean, there's a lot of glass across my, my house, and I have a sort of 14 month old baby, and I would not want sort of a second residence to be built there and something on the side without addressing first the issue of the kind of manufacturing we have there. I wouldn't want sort of the zoning to come first, and then we have more accidents of children and things happening after we've done the zoning. So the simple question is what kind of information can I get from whom as to who are my neighbors in terms of manufacturing? And, and what kind of pressure can we put on them as a community to First be able to... To your left, because Voislava, who is standing right next to you, is now going out actually door to door and looking and fine tuning some of the research to find out what exactly are in those mixed use areas. And you're absolutely right. The, the, one of the things that the zoning will bring with it, however, is greater regulation over those that would violate. 
uh, and there's less regulation in some of these areas now because it isn't reflected that way. The reality, however, is that if you're next door to that already, you're in a mixed use zone. And in a lot of the buildings that we see industry located, we do know that they're residents in the buildings. And so they're not there in a conforming way right now. And what we'd like to do is bring them into conformance, deal with the environmental issues, and through both carrots, incentives, as well as penalization, bring up those recalcitrant and those poor businesses up to a better standard. Uh, it's not going to be done overnight. And whether we recognize it in the zoning or we don't recognize it in the zoning, that's what's happening there. If any of you have gone out looking for space, and you might have done this in this community, and are looking for uh, places to live, you're also being taken to industrial buildings. Right. You know that. Everybody in this neighborhood has gone out knows that what was former industrial space is now being leased as residential lofts. Some of that's very positive in a way. Some of that is filling up spaces that wouldn't be rented. Others may be displacing jobs. That's the kind of fine tuning we want to do. Some of the people moving into the building may be moving into polluted buildings. So it needs to be brought into some form. I think we need a map like that. That's not a point for the 187 acre. Uh, it happens to be um, the Goldman property which is right down the street from where I live. Right. And in addition to that, my law firm was, my law firm, can I borrow it? The fact that the Goldman property is a big part of this plan and also that my law firm happens to represent them as clients um, is problematic because if the Goldmans refuse to sell that property, then you're going to lose a big track. Now, um, your assistant actually said to me, in not so many words that you would hold the Goldman's hostage by holding up any plans that they had for construction in Europe in the in the uh, community board. Now, whether they sell or not, you, you're going to run into a brick wall. You're going to run into a wall where you're going to try to develop the, the waterfront and you're not going to be able to move past the Goldman property because that's a big track of, of land. So my, my, my question is, what contingency plans or what plans are in place for those owners, those owners of property who refuse to sell in order to develop this 1A7A plan? And I just want to address this gentleman's question about the housing, the housing in Greenpoint. Um, affordable housing and market rate housing. Market rate housing, 90% of Greenpoint residents will have to move, okay, because we, we can barely afford what you pay rent now. That's why you moved. That's why you moved out of Williamsburg. You moved out of Williamsburg because you got a little bit cheaper rent. But anyone here who rents an apartment is already paying a lot. And I and I know that we all want to see high-rise buildings on the waterfront, uh, paying twelve, thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars a month rent. But there aren't that many people in Greenpoint who can probably afford that. Okay. So what you can do is get a higher influx of people from Manhattan. And I think it's unfair to develop a plan for Manhattan when you need to develop a plan for Greenpoint first. I mean, uh, the People's Firehouse presented with real problems. Uh, first of all, we're not proposing any high rise. Second of all, uh, we are advocating as much affordable housing or market rate housing that is affordable to Greenpoint residents. I think that was clear in the document that we want market rate housing affordable to Greenpoint residents. And so the idea, now, the two points you make are totally contradictory, if I might say. On one side, you're saying that the owner is not going to give in to a plan which provides for public access and some subsidized housing and is going to go off on their own. And on the other hand, you're saying that what we should do is mandate affordable housing. Now, we would love to do that. We would love to guarantee that there be affordable housing for every resident in this community. There is no way that a 197A plan can do that, okay? If it were, I'd be the first one online. In fact, there's some people in this room who would attack me because I've been an advocate of affordable housing. Adam and a couple of other people in this room know where I've come from and what I've done over the years. No. Public action to regulate how the land should be used for the best public purpose. And if we think the best public purpose is waterfront access along that waterfront over the long term, that owner can build as of right now or based on what the new zoning allows in the future. So I don't care whether it's Goldman or myself or somebody else. 
whoever owns property has to be subject to the greater good of the city. And that's what zoning does. And I think that's critically important to do there. Uh, Annette, and then uh, Bill, and then you, okay? I fight, you know my fight, that's one of my biggest fights. I live on the eastern end of the community. I am directly impacted by them. And just in this general area, why this not being included in, in the plan right here? This is Brooklyn Union Gas. That's all M3 land. That's a future site for a very, very large transfer station. And you know what? I'm made of each garbage in this community. But see, this is left out of the plan. That's why I'm fighting for this to be in the plan. That's what I'm talking about. If we could do preservation here and land off these two gas tanks, there'll never be a potential site for garbage in our community. Yes, and you gotta really keep on, you gotta keep on looking at what's going on. We're an opera house. We're an opera house. And that, and, and that, if you remember in my slides, the thing I show here, Fall Flag Park being here, is part of the plan. We're going to do what we can. Right. But it's not, it's not mentioned in anything. It wasn't mentioned in the beginning. It wasn't mentioned in the beginning. Yeah, it was mentioned. It really was. I'm not the slide is 95% really available. Yeah. 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 property is 95% abandoned now and vacant. Is he holding that some developer is going to come and give them a nice piece of change? Yeah. It's been abandoned <laughs> as long as I've been a little girl. Well, quite frankly, all the property along the Brooklyn waterfront has been held in speculation as to what will happen when the area gets rezoned or the market turns around. I think the Goldman family, and I can't speak for the Goldmans, uh, are both in, uh, they're, uh, they're in litigation against each other. They're, there's a whole series of issues there. But the, the, the property is basically being warehoused for future speculation. And I think that's what's really hurt the waterfront. And, that, and so what we really think we need to do now, and part of the rezoning, is to say this is what will happen. And that the city act and act clearly. This will remain industrial. This will be mixed use. This will be housing. So you take away the speculation and allow people to go ahead and begin to develop the property where the community believes the development is appropriate. Again, zoning cannot address the subsidies or the level of housing. And quite frankly, all housing is subsidized in the United States. Luxury housing gets more subsidies than any other housing. Because if you know it, uh, anybody knows our tax laws, if you buy your own property, you deduct it, uh, the mortgage against your taxes, Home mortgage deductions are the greatest subsidies the United States have. No, you, you don't. Uh, you and I are getting old there. Can't study, Stella. We, uh, we can own our houses out right now. Tony. What's the time frame for written comment? Oh, as soon as possible. <laughs> if you can get it to us by the middle of next week, we really want to get back on track. Then there'll be comment after it goes to the city, uh, uh, to the community board before it goes to the city planning commission. And secondly, is there going to be some type of follow-up with the business community the Green Point, similar to what was on the one man septum in the Green Point time? Uh, we would like to do that, yes. Yeah. But that, we've been talking to some of the uh, business people. Not enough. I am partially familiar with what's going on. For the last for the last 11 years I've been living in Europe, my question is, um, what, what are the possibilities? Is there anything being done and has there been talk about perhaps turning Manhattan Avenue, for example, into a pedestrian zone, thereby, uh, actually, my experience in Europe has been that areas that have been turned into pedestrian zones commercially in terms of business and everything have really enhanced those particular areas where they have been developed. And my, my question is, is there a possibility of turning Manhattan Avenue, for example, into a pedestrian zone? What they usually do is they have the um, suppliers and what have you come into the community uh, in the mornings, and after that, it's open only to, to pedestrians. Um, bus traffic and what have you is either rerouted or they have something in, 
in terms of a uh, small trolley or mini buses or what have you, uh, uh, periodically going. That's the only traffic that you see on the main street where this kind of. Well, the photograph I showed you from Strasbourg. Yeah, that sounds great. Finally. Uh, I think. That was, I think the possibility of doing that at the outset is is nil. I mean, the couple of discussions we had, I actually broached at an early meeting. Can we have one discussion, please? I actually broached it with a meeting with, that we did have with some of the business community, and they really uh, looked at me like I was a little out of my mind. Now, people do that normally, uh, but uh, this, uh, this was a little bit too much. What we are proposing is uh, the introduction first of what really would be a European style people move, whether it's uh, New York City is not ready, and I, we've had some uh, informal conversations with people who work with the MTA. They're not ready to look at tramways or light rail the way Seattle and Portland and other US cities are doing it now, which really provides totally accessible vehicles the way the European cities do now with the very low trolleys. Right. But they are looking for a sim at a similar vehicle, which is a bus, which will have a wide door, right. uh, which will allow curb, direct curb access so you can get on faster and quicker. Right. Once we have the mass transit in place, I think that kind of suggestion probably could come on down the line. Uh, I, I really think it wouldn't work right now. One of the things that we're talking about, though, is to try to get some of the parking by creating one anchor parking garage on the very northern end. Now, there was some criticism of the proposed Manhattan Avenue Bridge, but I must say the idea did not come from us. It came from a great number of people in the community. There is positive reaction on the Queen side because it would then create a con continuity of Manhattan Avenue as a commercial strip. We're talking about it only really as a footbridge, but a couple of the businesses have suggested that it also carry some form of mass transit across. That would connect the northern part of Greenpoint back to its traditional connection with Hunter's Point, which was a very important connection, which the highway over the Pulaski Bridge did not create because it is basically a through uh, area. The other one would link the two sort of neighborhoods together. So it still makes sense to me that we keep it in there. If they think it's crazy, they won't build it. Uh, but you know, let's at least broach the idea because I think it'll do a lot to rejuvenate that area. Uh, and I must tell Annette and the others that I really think their arguments are quite valid on the other area. Part of the frustration I had is that at the meeting we had two months ago, we had done all the work and we did not want to slow down the process. Get something like Fulton Street. Well, for handicapped people, if they walk down to McGinnis Boulevard and walk back up this way, it's out of the question. Nobody cannot walk that good. Now, I have another good question here. I have the Holy Name Square. I represent the Holy Name in Greenpoint here. Uh, from the Brooklyn Diocese. We have a square on Anger and Newtown, Newton and McGinnis Boulevard. I'd like to have it enlarged with one car going through like they have on Graham Avenue with the American Legion uh, Park. And fences around there because kids get in there, they'll ruin the property. I want trees to uh, be put in there, three, three of them. I have an application at home. And uh, I, I have a monument too, to name all the churches on the monument. Is there any way of getting that? Uh, one, of the, one of the greatest concerns I've heard from people living in Greenpoint for the years I've been living here is uh, the quality of the air. And um, in the area, I'd like to put forward a proposal as part of the 197A plan as part of the funding that the plan will receive for all the development of the area and the beautification of the of Greenpoint is an air monitoring program uh, which would basically consist of having instruments that are necessary to monitor the air to determine what substances are in the air and what are dangerous levels so that people are aware of what they're actually breathing in and, and you know can then decide if the facilities that are emitting any toxic substances or, or
byproducts can be held accountable for what they're doing. So it's a proposal I think that should be very much part of what is being what is being planned <coughs> with the, the greening and with the waterfront development. Uh, I think your proposal is excellently on in some of the earlier presentations and the slides I showed, where I showed the Botrop uh, water pollution plant, there was a public monitoring station where the public could come view, see what was happening, and actually monitor what was going on in the, uh, uh, at the water pollution plant. And we also proposed a number of monitoring stations along Newtown Creek and the East River. Uh, I think along the way in the editing between the monitoring museum and the monitoring stations, we got out monitored and I think dropped out one of the monitors that we should have. But your idea, I think, is a, a right on target, and we'll make sure it's back in there. Who is number two? What is the biggest obstacle to having the plan uh, approved or accepted? Planning. Well, uh, hopefully it won't be the community board. Uh, uh, but there is, it has to go through the community board process. Uh, the next biggest obstacle is getting it by the city planning commission. Uh, the commission may fear that by adopting the plan they are committing themselves to dealing with the environmental issues in the community uh, and i think that's a problem that both williamsburg and greenpoint face uh, quite frankly that's an issue uh, but it's one that a united community can really overcome uh, and a patient community because it may be that uh, you know there are only 333 days left in this administration um, I don't know. We, we have to work towards uh, educating our the members of the commission. And believe me, I sat on it. We needed to be educated. A lot of people show up but never listen to the public, and I think it's important that they begin to listen. So I, I really think it's important that uh, there be mobilization for it. I think the real biggest obstacle is even if the plan passes, without having an organized community, a community that will be committed to the goals of the plan, that it could easily be passed and never implemented. And I think one of the real issues is to move the zoning resolutions as quickly as possible so that they go coterminous with the plan. Because if they don't, then there's a good chance that the things will begin to unravel uh, the way they have in a number of other communities where they pass 197A plans. The one area where they've done it coterminous with the zoning is in Chelsea, and that's the one community I can guess is most successful. So tying it directly to the zoning becomes crucial. Okay, where was the third? So how do we help move those zoning changes along? What can we do? Well, I think one of the things is we need to modify the plan based on, our, on the comments today. Uh, we're going to try to get it to the community board as quickly as possible. Uh, it will be then reissued for public comment. You've got to come out and support it there. And then make sure that your church groups, your community groups, your block associations, and the civic groups all get together. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we will make sure, uh, and we'll continue to try to work with you as well, to make sure that we move them step by step in whatever actions come up. It really, you know, it's like, excuse me if I sound too male chauvinistic at the moment, but it's like a football game or a ball game. Um, and that is if you have a strategy and you know what your plays are, you know what to do when the other team fumbles or when you're on the offense. And I think that's really where we, we've got to go. We've got to have an idea of where our goals are and what we do under different circumstances. And that's when we're on the defensive, when we're trying to fight something that we think will be adverse to the community, as well as where we think we have an opportunity to implement something when it's positive. And I think a united community and overcome the differences, because this community has got more you know, problems in common, and the differences aren't that great. And so we really need to see how we can bring those together and then people just working together. That's the only thing I can tell you. Like the women's hockey team at the Olympics. Right. <laughs> Uh, that gentleman? Okay, go ahead. Thanks. It sort of all it has to do with the same thing. Um, is there any way, if our name is on the, we signed in, you know, we came in, is there any way we can get a schedule? Somebody can tell us 
when things are happening, when we need to show up in certain places, who we can write to to be supportive of the <coughs> Because it all, you know, it's you sort of stumble into certain things, but it's hard to know. Yeah, well, we tried to make sure you didn't have to stumble into this. We yeah. printed 10,000, right. and these yes. folks up here distributed 8,500 copies yes. and saturated this community. Have Somebody didn't problem. see it. I've been here for almost 18 years. This is the first time I really got something concrete at my doorstep. Right. Well, we, I, I just, it cost a lot of money. I don't know if you can afford it. Well, I mean, happy but to, I suggest you look at the Greenpoint Gazette, and we will try to keep the mailing list and make sure that everybody who's here uh, gets contacted on the phone. Do you send things out on the mailing list? We will do it now. So at one of the board meetings, uh, Ms. Maletta, who was not able to be there, and the subject was brought up, about the entire waterfront plan, I raised my hand and said, we have already chosen to separate and have two plans because we have truly distinct differences from Williamsburg and Greenpoint. And the, the fact is that we've gone ahead for some time now. And as uh, to, to point out to Ms. Lamada, I don't know if she's still here. I'm right here. We, we, we were, oh, okay. We did. We did expand continually, and then we were told we couldn't go any further, okay, by the chairperson of the entire waterfront committee. So we had plans to include further, but they wouldn't. They didn't want us to do it. And um, I'd like to. I'd like to mention the fact that we have so much pollution in the area. But through my committee, which I am president of, the concern for the Greenpoint. So practically a decade took that long to shut down the incinerator. So that was a big plus for the community, less pollution in the air and in the water. The next issue that we worked with with the state was to make certain that they do not increase the expansion of the water pollution control plant. And that was another battle. It was years before it was conceded by the state that the New York City Department of Environmental Protection has to change their plans because the North River plans that was built in the Harlem area was having serious pollution problems after it was upgraded to secondary treatment. Now this Newtown Creek plant, if you don't know it, is on Greenpoint Avenue, on Provost Street, and on North Henry Street, which will be expanded to include Kingsland Avenue. What we were able to do is convince the state to have the city change their plans because of the fact that the North River plant was having problems after it was upgraded to secondary treatment. And my big argument was, well, if we're going to do upgrading to secondary treatment here and we're getting deeper tanks than what they have in North River, what is the benefit? It's going to be a serious problem again. You're going to waste our tax dollars. You're going to waste the health and the time for the community to have it upgraded to secondary treatment. Well, the mandate from 1972 by the federal government says that it should be mandated, and it is mandated to be upgraded to secondary treatment. OK, so it has to be done, but at the same time, I do not expect it to be made larger. It is physically being made larger, but we cannot approve or agree to have additional wastewaters coming into this plant. And uh, as far as monitoring, is that what you want to talk about? Monitoring. No. Somebody mentioned monitoring the air. Yes. Did. Uh, we will have monitors at the plant itself and around its perimeter. They will be handheld and stationary ones. So they will have some indication of what type of uh, chemicals, dust, whatever is, is uh, coming out of the plate while they're upgrading it and pile driving, et cetera. Uh, I'm hearing about all of these improvements and about all the things we'll be gaining, but I haven't heard any mention tonight about uh, what we'll be losing. And uh, we hear about improvements in transit, but Transit Authority is uh, bent on terminating G service 24 hours a day north of Port Square. And this will have an impact on this community, a loss of transportation for us. Bill, 
I mean, he's addressed this a number of times in the committee. He's taken some action. He's gone and met with the uh, state assembly. We've included some recommendations there. Again, this is a plan. This is the community's plan, and the plan is the strategy that it's proposing over the next couple of years. It doesn't mean it will come into existence, but unless people mobilize and unless they fight for it, uh, you know, we're going to lose things like the G-Train. The G-Train affects you, it affects all of us at Pratt, because uh, when they cut the G-Train, we lose students, and I lose my job. And we, we're all going to fight for that one. But I think it's critically important that we begin to look at the, this thing as a strategy. It is not going to result in the development, but the same way we plan to go on a vacation nine months from now, or a couple of years from now, or we plan our retirements, or we plan our, our, our children's weddings and, and confirmations and bar misses or whatever it is. Whenever that is, we need to plan for this community because otherwise it gets trod upon by others. And I think it's about time there was a strategy here.